filter. I've been working on actually developing the uh, co-access of folks and go over how uh, we're planning on creating that right now. Uh, first, of course, I'm going to go over the uh, lay of the land, so to speak, as it stands and what we're trying to accomplish with it and uh, a little bit of repetitive information from what Patricia just went over, but with more emphasis on the details that concern co-access. So first, okay, okay. So first, this is the uh, the flow, so to speak, or the way the co-access goes. This was supposed to be in a later slide. But, uh, yeah, I'll get back to it. That's fine. Uh, I have a slide often. So, uh, so first, what's co-access? Uh, essentially, it's the ability of multiple uh, DOI owners very much like what we saw with the multi-resolution, except in this case, we're talking about the DOIs and not just the URLs, to be able to reference the same book content. Uh, so the most important part of this is that it's mostly automated, in that once you've unlocked or uh, made available what you want to allow for co-access, you'll be able to allow uh, the other party to send in their DOI with the similar metadata to then generate the uh, co-access uh, situation, so to speak. Um, so the way that this differs from multi-resolution, uh, I need to go over what multi-resolution is. I know we've covered that part, so I'll go through it quickly. Um, but basically, uh, multi-resolution comes in a bunch of different places. The first, of course, is handle when a user comes in and asks for a particular DOI. Handle has the information that we saw, which I'll go over in more detail later. again. Uh, to resolve to our high page, but it also includes that multi-resolution control string, which has inside of it the other URLs and the other labels and parties involved in uh, hosting the content. Um, that, of course, brings me to the IP controller, which does the uh, reading of the control string from handle and finding the, uh, the interim page. Uh, currently, as things stand, the interim page, we call them templates, have to be sent to us and have to be marked up with the label that we're expecting to see. So you have to know what publishers are going to be coming into this landing page to be able to uh, uh, resolve them with the appropriate information. Uh, and as we saw, this is essentially what the XML ends up looking like once you've unlocked the uh, multi-resolution <coughs> here. And then further people have come in and deposited these URLs. We in Prospect aggregate them uh, into the uni XML automatically. So uh, as Trisha said, we don't actually have to have you send in all of the metadata, simply the DOI involved and the uh, URLs and your labels for uh, assuming, of course, the initial DOI has been unlocked. Um, this is what the multi resolution control string looks like inside of Handle. Trisha uh, showed that momentarily in the actual Handle resolver page. But there's a couple of things of interest in here that I need to go over. Uh, the first, of course, is that the labels here, uh, in, in our case, I'm sorry, our, our test, uh, test user information. Um, these guys, the CR source and the label, are somewhat different. And the source is basically the person who did the uploading of that particular URL. Uh, in the uh, co-access situation, this is all going to be co-access. Because we're going to be generating this control string ourselves. We won't be uh, expecting any users to have uh, their input. However, the label will contain information about the depositor uh, so that later on we can access that to uh, present who uh, is involved in the actual co access. Um, so, this is the way that the flow of multi resolution goes. Again, uh, Patricia has pretty much gone over this, uh, but I'll go over it quickly. So, the publishers involved have to know who else is going to be involved, and they have to make a template with the labels that the other publishers are going to use. And they have to send us the template page, which then uh, adds them in our database in a group that says you're all allowed to send in URLs for these uh, uh, for these uh, multi-resolution deposits. And of course, that all comes to us. Um, when the publishers actually go to do that, the first publisher, the first depositor of the DOI, sends in all the metadata and sends in the unlocked uh, flag, the set, uh, and uh, they have to coordinate that the publisher, the second person to come through, they have to uh, make sure that the first has done the unlock so that they can deposit their bit of uh, XML, which is, again, just the DOI, their label, and the uh, URLs. 
send out to a browser, and we, of course, merge them into the database, and we send in the local evolution control string into Handy, as well as the other resulting URLs that we saw. And this is the same page that uh, Trisha was showing you. This is what it works out to. Uh, the reason I, I bring it up is because the graphics and uh, some of the text, the ones that didn't have the tags that Patricia had on top, are in the actual page. And each of these publishers are uh, specified as a label. And so when the deposit, when the deposit for this was made, if another publisher had come in, it would not show up on this page. Uh, in fact, I think it might even show an error. So uh, what do we solve with full access? How, how do we want to make this different? Right? Um, the, the strong coordination where publishers have to make sure the condition of UI is unlocked and uh, to make sure that uh, we have the, uh, the I page involved and the template and so on. Um, that we're trying to alleviate by basically you know, all of the automation. Um, the templates, we're going to uh, make essentially a base template, which then is going to uh, have inside of it uh, just an open list essentially. So whomever is involved in the multi in the uh, pro access uh, will simply show up in there. The way that we're going to show the icons uh, is by you, the publishers, will be sending them to us and we'll be storing them in our database per prefix. So any of the icons that we um, expect to see in the, uh, uh, the resolution pages for the publishers need to have been sent to us. Otherwise, we'll just have some generic. Uh, Logo in there. So the reason I'm saying we will uh, rather than it is is because this is still in process, and so uh, any comments you folks might have would be greatly appreciated. And anything you might see, if there uh, there may be some problems uh, that we haven't thought of yet. So the way that Core Access will, as it stands, work is the publishers tell us who other what other publishers are okay to. Uh, send in information about um, their, their DOIs. And that basically says that pro access will now become permitted. And so these prefixes are permitted to be pro access deposits. And uh, again, I'm not going, uh, I'm not repeating the word books, but for right now, this is only to do with books and not journals. Uh, so when the deposit comes in, we check to see uh, the, set, the situation of pro access in the actual deposit. And this basically determines if the deposit coming in is already owned by a different uh, prefix. We check to see if they are from a permitted group. And we see that that's uh, the case. We say now that coaccess is enabled. And again, this is during our own process flow. So the enablement is uh, our, what's going on inside. This does not mean that this deposit has become a coaccess deposit. So the next step, of course, is to check to see uh, if there are any matching ISSNs or ISBNs, uh, as since books can have series, those are the ISSN control, uh, for titles, uh, for title level deposits, it's only the ISSNs or ISBNs. The metadata is uh, not examined in this case further than that. Um, and what we do basically is say, oh, okay, you're sending us a new deposit. You're a different owner, uh, a different prefix, and there is already this ISSN in our system. So we make sure that everybody involved has co-access, so we're now permitted, right? And it simply means that the current one is uh, okay to go. Um, and when everything is now determined to be okay, so that there are more than one, in the event this is being the second one, and that our uh, prefixes involved are uh, permitted to do so, and we're obviously enabling at this point, the DOIs are put into the the coaxis is put into effect for these DOIs. Uh, that is the flow, the terminology that we'll be using. And so the problem, as I was saying, will be solved simply by uh, examining the ISSNs and ISBNs to find the matching uh, volumes. Uh, the chapter information, they don't obviously have ISSNs or ISBNs specifically, but they are held within uh, titles of view. Uh, their metadata needs to match uh, the sequence numbers and the pages and such to uh, determine whether or not these uh, bits of information should also be in pro access. So the server-side automation is the bit where you don't have to worry about uh, who the other person is and whether you have the template in place and so on. We'll create all of those things. We'll manage making an multi-resolution string. You don't have to send us the, uh, anything further. You're simply depositing a DOI the way that you're used to depositing it. Um, right, so this is the way that the coaxis workflow I expect would be happening. Uh, essentially, you opt in to say, 
we want these publishers to allow us to do the deposits. And then you simply deposit your XML as you would any other time. The only bit you have to be careful of, of course, is to have matching ISIS and an ISBN. Uh, they don't all have to match, just at least one of these groups so you can have multiples of them. Crossref then takes your information, merges it, puts it in the database, and updates handle uh, with that. Uh, a note there, the XML of your deposit is not manipulated in any way uh, in reference to coaxes. The only thing that is actually uh, changed is what goes into the handle. So when you retrieve the metadata for your particular DOI, it will look exactly the way that you expect it to with no other folks' information. This does pose a problem, which I will get to in a moment. Uh, then the user who goes to resolve the DOI uh, will go and ask handle as the dx.doi.org, and that will point them to Crossref, unless the tags that Patricia pointed out are used uh, to reference a page directly. And Crossref will look up the template, figure out the multi resolution uh, information, realize that this is coaxial, and list everybody involved in this DOI and present the page back to the user. So essentially the big question that everybody ends up asking is, well, what do I have to do differently? So most of it's the same, but the first thing, of course, you have to do is say that this, uh, these publishers are uh, okay to do co-access for our books. And then uh, you can decide that specific books are opted out. Again, you can tell us which one's there and we'll mark them. Uh, right now we don't have a user-facing interface uh, in plan, but will be on the admin page for those who do have access to that. Um, so there is the possibility of generating your own multi-resolution page, but as things stand right now, we expect there to simply be this default one with the icons for the publishers that have uh, sent in. Uh, the deposits for the metadata will not have to include anything to do with multi-resolution or any of the other unlock tags, anything like that. Just send them in as if it was your own DOI. Uh, the, as I said a moment ago, the, the XML isn't modified in any way, and everything else we, we basically handle for you. So simply the first step here. You tell us who is okay to be in co-access, tell us what ones, what books you don't want to have co-access, and then go about your business. So a little bit more technical now getting in. Um, right, so to determine who uh, the co-access candidates are when a deposit comes in. That is done by the ISSN, as I mentioned. The permissions are ensured by looking at a number of factors. The first, of course, is the DOI being deposited has to be owned by the previous deposit. So that person has that permission to do so, which is no different than previously. And then if the ISSN is being referenced, belongs to a different prefix, then we have to look to see there if uh, they're in co-access and make sure that that's all. And we have to check to see that the book itself is not excluded from uh, the exclusions list. When that's all okay, we then generate the uh, control string. And the control string will have to have all of the uh, URLs, of course, but we go and fetch them. You don't have to know them, you don't have to worry about them. Right? Um, and then we can, it, with this thing, we can uh, create with this process, we can create an arbitrary number of them. You don't have to say there are three and only three in this template. You can specify a number of publishers, and as they become, uh, as they start hosting their own versions of the DOI, they can then uh, deposit them at their layer. And this is the more specific way. Uh, so this is, again, flow. When somebody comes to go and deposit a new book, they go and deposit it. We look at the ISSN and ISBN. We look for matching ones. And since this is a new book, nothing of the sort is made. So your DOI is deposited. No big deal. Somebody else comes along. They have the same ISSN or ISBN as yours. We find it. We check to see if you and they are both in a coaxis group. And that basically was the first step earlier. And now coaxis becomes enabled. So you were both permitted at that point, and now we're enabled. The DOI processing continues just as normal until we get to the point where we go to put the information into the handle. And here are a, uh, 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 so once we put the information into the handle, nothing in the XML has changed. And this is the one problem that we're talking about, where once the XML has been generated, you can't really tell 
But as Chuck pointed out earlier, we have this what we call the meta metadata, the information about the information, about your information that we're storing. Um, this comes up in the UniXSD uh, view of your metadata. There are several ways of getting at your metadata, as I'm sure you're all well aware, and we call them CRM items. Um, and that I believe stands for cross reference metadata. Uh, and the new tag that we'll be having, the new name, will be called INCO Access Rule. So each of the separate DOIs will list all of the DOIs that they are in co-access rule, assuming co-access has occurred. Uh, in, uh, so the type is DOI simply, and the DOI of the other, or all of the records are listed one in each of these tags, one in each of the main INCO Access Rule tags. Um, chapters don't really work uh, in exactly the same way, because as I said, there is no one specific identifier for them, except when you go to assign your DOI to them. But these are the bits of metadata that they look at to do the matching. Uh, most of these are, in fact, uh, optional, so if you don't have them, uh, the other side also needs to not have them, otherwise they won't match. Uh, so if you don't have a page, as uh, if you have electronic content, both sides have to not have a page. If you deposit a chapter that does have a page and someone else didn't, they won't be in co access. So they'll simply be in <coughs> um, Right, so this is just the uh, the I page controller, the template that we were uh, speaking about previously. The icons for the publishers are retrieved from our internal databases. You don't have to host them anywhere, you just need to send them to us. We haven't quite determined the, uh, the, the formats yet for that, but I'm sure any HTML format uh, uh, option is sufficient. And we'll be putting those in per previous. So this is uh, a point of contention. Um, for right now, there's, there's only going to be the one for per the previous. Uh, anything further, let us know if, uh, what you might want and we'll see what we can accomplish 